scary. I look at her every day, so I can confirm that. What the Western Predator Control Association is doing is doing research. We're a scientific, research, educational, nonprofit organization. Right now, we're looking into canine diseases. Specifically, we're looking into the diseases that are associated with coyotes, foxes, wolves, your working dogs, your home pets. In reality, we're dealing in the area of finding out what is actually out there. Now, I was told a story here, and some of you have heard my presentation before, you've probably heard this, this story before. But it seems that there was a congresswoman flying from Washington to uh, the West Coast. And she got on a plane, and there was a young woman sitting there who was the daughter of a rancher. And the congresswoman went over to her and said, sat down, and she said, would you like to talk? If we talk together, our flight will go more rapidly. So the young woman said, well, what would you like to talk about? And the congresswoman said, well, why don't we talk about health care, the stimulus package and other governmental things that are going on in Washington. The girl liked that and said, well, first let me ask you a question. Cattle drop clumps. Deer drop pellets. She said, why do you suppose that is? Congressman Park pondered that and she said, I don't know, why is that? To which the girl replied, you don't know why that is, you don't know shit. <laughs> and so as a result, our research is concentrated on the scat and its effect on our environment out there. We're specifically concentrating and looking at what we have classified, and it's called an atypical tapeworm. And its scientific name is Echinococcus granulosus. You probably have seen that term. For discussion today, we're just going to call it an atypical tapeworm. And the reason we're going to call that is it's unlike any other tapeworm you've ever seen. It's unlike any other tapeworm that your veterinarians have been working with. It's unlike any other tapeworm that you in the ranching and cattle business and livestock business have, have uh, in this area have contended with. What we do know is that from state research at Washington State University Laboratory in Pullman, they took in 123 carcasses of wolves. Now you probably have read this report or heard this number. 62% of those wolves that were taken out of Idaho has to have this tapeworm. 63% in Montana had this tapeworm. March, uh, excuse me, January 20th of this year, I testified in front of the legislative committee in Helena. And I stood up, and this was the environmental uh, committee, environmental quality committee. And I stood up and I said, you know, based on your data, and based on that lab report, somewhere between 63 and 90 percent of the terrain out there in Montana where these wolves are or have been or will be, is polluted. Man, it went silent. Next, they had a fellow come up who was, I think, was one of the deputies of the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And he was asked, do you agree with what Mr. Detlefson just said? A little silence, and the first thing he said was, it's hard to argue with a health issue that could affect the population of the state. He said, it was followed up. He said, well, you know, kind of, that wasn't a question. You know how politicians are. That wasn't a question. So he, he got them to, to reiterate, and he said, well, I agree with the minimum. What the study said that came out of the laboratory is that you do have the disease. The disease is established. Its life cycle is very, very active, and it can only get worse. It started out, if you want to believe the initial material that was put out by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and USDA, we didn't have that tapeworm here. Their wolves, when they brought them in here, for example, and the reason I say wolves is, 
is because this lab report concentrated and made it obvious that the main distribution of this tapeworm was coming from the wolves. It wasn't coming from coyotes or foxes. It wasn't coming from your herd dogs. It wasn't coming from your hunting dogs. And so we began to look at this, and we have taken up the challenge to find out where it is, where in the terrain it is, where its distribution is, where its density is, where its concentrations are, and where its saturation is. Now the key thing in our research that we're working on right now is if you don't become exposed to the disease, you're no problem. If you become exposed to that because you walked into the area where it is, you begin to have a problem. But you really still don't have a much of a problem. If you come in contact with it, and if I had more time, I'd show, I'd talk about how that happens. Now you've got a much greater problem. If you ingest, inject, or inhale it, which you can do, now you've got a real problem. Well, what does that mean? Okay, what it means is those people that are exposed come in contact and ingest, not everybody gets to take them. It's a very low percentage. However, you may have read the uh, George Devil's uh, outdoorsman, the last article in June or the article before that, and he talked about a woman in the state who was misdiagnosed. She had the disease in her liver, misdiagnosed, took two years to get it corrected, she lost a third of her liver. That cost that family $63,000 for the treatment. It cost a year of her life. And when I discuss this with health board people, which we have, they kind of go, ah, so what, it was only one person. You know, in this country, we've got about 770,000 doctors. <coughs> Those doctors treat a lot, a lot of patients every year, but every year, 170,000 people die that have treatment by doctors. On the other hand, you know, we've got 80 million gun owners in the country. FBI statistics say 1,500 people die every year of gunshot wounds. You're 9,000 times more likely to die going to the doctor than you are getting shot in the street. So when you start taking a look at that, I said, well, you know, what about lawyers? <laughs> well, I decided not to look into lawyers because I was afraid you'd go see doctors. <laughs> In any event, as we go through this research, we're trying to qualify, quantify, and codify what is in your area. Is it in the wilderness? And that's where it is? Is it in the urban, rural, residential areas because you have to be exposed to it before you have to be say you've got a problem out there and nobody right now knows where this disease is and we need to find that out now it started out with discussions with a lot of the folks that are pro con and so forth on this issue and we don't, we're not in a position to say I don't care what side you're on I don't care if you're in the middle. This disease is addressed to whom it may concern. And so it's necessary for us to figure out what's going on. We are in the process of doing that. We have a chapter of the Western Credit Control Association here in Lemai County. Uh, Rowdy Davis, who stood up a few minutes ago, is part of the board. I don't know how many folks know Mike uh, Kostler. here, one of the ranchers in, in the county. He's the vice president, and Craig Lantis is the president here. And what we're seeking here is people that want to participate to collect the information. Now, granted, it can be classified as biohazardous material, but we handle biohazardous material in hospitals all the time. So we need some assistance to get the information. So I'm here to give you some information. I'm here to solicit your participation with the study. I don't want to mislead anyone. Scientific research does not pre-conclude an answer. It doesn't say, I know what I want it to be because I have this agenda, therefore I'm going to make the data fit it. It doesn't work that way. This has got to be open, transparent, and the information in the study has to be strong enough to withstand court challenge. It would not behoove anybody with this to do this in any other fashion, an open, transparent, and working with everybody that has an interest and concern.
with that, and that's what we're attempting to do with that. Um, the, what we found now is just a few more, a little bit more information from that study. About, I think there was about, uh, if I had my slides up, I could tell you exactly. They broke down the eggs and the tapeworms that they found in these wolves. Now the data was good and was able to be assigned to a geographic location, but not a specific area. Okay. It's that kind of like the difference for using a, a compass to locate yourself by resection or a GPS. Okay. The data was there. They knew it came from this county or that county, but not exactly where. But 33% of the sample, they didn't remember where they got it. So it makes the data a little soft, other than the fact we know where the wolves are in Idaho. We know where they've been. We know where they're going. The exposure used to be defined as you go out to the wilderness, low exposure, probably not going to get it, not a problem. Ranchers, livestock owners in general, people who have lost pets can tell you that exposure direction has changed. The disease is being brought to your area. Now worldwide, you've got, for example, there was a study done in Nepal, and people say, well, that's a backward country. Well, it's not really a backward country, it's a backward location. In their uh, rural areas where they have the disease, about 14% of their population, we're talking millions of people, 14% of their population have the disease. But as you get closer to residential areas, communities and so forth, where the disease is, is brought by their, their pets, their dogs, wild, free roaming, what have you, 25% of the population has it. Now there's 27 characteristics that you can look at worldwide that define what goes on in the world areas that have the disease. 13 of those are in our three state area, Wyoming are being, are de being developed. However, when you look at the 13, you can really consolidate them down to six. Okay. One of the biggest ones that causes the problem with people contracting disease, and they get it more usual from their own pets in residential areas than they get it from going out into the wilderness, is to understand how that happens and treat that. If you know, you can avoid. If you don't know, you don't know whether you're avoiding or not. Okay. We have uh, Gary here uh, that runs, as I understand, I talked to him, met him yesterday. Uh, been around here a long time, an outfitter hunter, what have you. And he wants to talk to me about a situation that happened to him eight years ago. He doesn't know he's got it or he doesn't have it. He doesn't know he's exposed to it. Probably got about a 14% chance of having contracted it while hunting. So what we're trying to do is, in a, in a nutshell, and I'll take any questions right after this, is to find together what we're faced with. If we don't have a problem, we need to know. <coughs> if we have a minor problem, we need to know where it is. If we have an ever-increasing problem, we need to know how it's evolving so we can prevent it. Now, a lot of folks we've briefed, particularly health boards, I've run into, and I've, we've briefed quite a few of them. We tried to encourage them to begin to look into this and notify the medical personnel, to begin, like the veterinarians, who begin to look for it and so forth. The problem that we run into is statements like this. Well, all you want to do is kill wolves. We haven't even looked at the wolves yet. We looked at coyotes and foxes in River Valley County and the Beaverhead. And our results, preliminary results, said this. Those animals that we tested take it from the locations we got them, they don't have the disease. It's very possible that we would find that out by testing other canines. It's just as possible, and this is what the research is directed at determining, that the opposite is true. But if the disease that we were able to assess, that the canines have dropped the eggs in your summer grazing area, in your riparian areas, in your watersheds, chances are those eggs that can live from hours to years